Good morning. Today is Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. This Shabbos is called Shabbos Nachamu, the Shabbos of comfort, of consolation. It's the Shabbos after Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, and the Haftorah that we will read this Shabbos in the synagogue is the famous prophecy of Yeshayo Hanavi, the prophet Isaiah, that starts with the words, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami. God says through his prophet, I will comfort you. I will comfort you, my people. And the word comfort is repeated. It occurs twice, Nachamu, Nachamu. There are a number of different reasons why it's repeated. One of them is we are comforted from God and we are comforted from each other. From God, the comfort that we receive is so beautiful. It's so reassuring. And the words of the prophet, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, they are written in the present tense. The prophet Yeshayahu is not only addressing his message of God's comfort to the people at his time, he is addressing it in every generation, speaking to us. We are being comforted by God. And who can read the words of this Haftorah, this passage in Isaiah, and not feel that we have turned a corner since last Sunday, the observance of Tisha B'Av? We read, Al Hagavoa Alilach Mevaseret Zion. Climb up on the high mountain, Zion's herald of good news. Lift up your voices with strength. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Israel, Behold your God. Behold, God is coming with might. His arm will rule for him. Like a shepherd, he will feed his flock. He will gather the lambs in his arms, carrying them gently, leading those with young. What beautiful words of comfort God is able to provide us. God's comfort. God's consolation is perfect. We, on the other hand, we need help. We often want to say the right thing to someone who needs comfort. We want to say the right words. We want to find the right words. But often we'll fall short. Often, sometimes, we even cause pain unintentionally by the words we choose to use when we intend to bring comfort. Unnecessarily. Letty Pogrebin is a Jewish writer in New York. And a number of years ago, she had cancer. It was serious. And she survived. And then she wrote a book about her experience. And the title of the book is How to Be a Friend to a Friend Who is Sick. And this book is filled with wisdom. I recommend it highly. Because as she writes, illness is friendship's proving ground. She writes about the difficulty asking someone who is sick, how are you? It's just the most natural thing. We do it all the time. Very often, it's the first thing we say, how are you? But the truth is, to ask that question of someone who is sick is very complex. There are many factors that go into how that interchange will work. She writes, there are times when these questions are perfectly legitimate, and you know they are coming from someone who truly wants to know the answer. But when the words are casually tossed my way as someone passes me in the hallway, 
I sometimes wonder, what do you want me to say? Now, usually a listener will intuit whether it is asked as a pleasantry or greeting, or if you really mean it when you say, how are you? And if you do really mean it, you need to be prepared to respect the answer. You know, often we say to someone, how are you? And we expect to hear, fine, okay, not bad, and then move on. And we're unprepared and uncomfortable when someone truthfully answers the question, well, I'll tell you how I am. And it may not be easy to hear. Now, on the other hand, from the point of view of the person who is sick, sometimes if someone asks me, how are you? Regardless of how I actually feel, I may not just be up to saying anything, but fine, that may be all I'm capable of saying. And if you're a friend and you hear that, you need to respect that also. She suggests that there are other questions to ask a friend who is sick that are more constructive, more helpful. For example, is today a good day? Are you in pain right now? How can I help? And notice, please, the difference, the very important difference. It's subtle, but it's extremely important. The difference between how can I help and can I help? When I say to you, how can I help? I'm expressing I'm already committed to helping. I just need the directions. I just need your instruction, but I'm already doing it. Can I help? Doesn't indicate any commitment at all. It's a very different question. A very different feeling is conveyed with that slight difference in words. And further, and this is something that is really helpful to keep in mind, it is usually much more beneficial to offer a concrete action, not just how can I help, which is a good start, but can I pick up your children today? Can I bring you dinner tomorrow? Make it specific. Can I do this thing for you? Now, what underlies all of this and is at the heart of really being a friend in a time of difficulty is we need to be able to ask honestly and we need to be able to answer honestly. She writes, tell me what's helpful and what's not. Tell me if you want to be alone and when you want company. Tell me what to bring and tell me when to leave. Give me a clue how you want to be treated. And it is essential that a person be able to develop the honesty, number one, to ask those questions, and number two, to be able to answer them honestly. That is what it means to be a true friend when someone is sick. If you have been sick yourself, and this is true not only of illness, but of any difficulty in life, you are in a position to be of tremendous help to someone else. Pogrebin writes, 
whoever has experienced a serious illness or tragedy and reaches out to help a friend in comparable circumstances is like the person who is able to go into your cave and sit there with you in the darkness while everyone else is standing outside trying to coax you to come out. It's much more helpful if you're able to enter the cave with them. We had a beloved member of Adath. He has since passed away at an advanced age. He and I were very close. He was devoted. He was warm, a patriarch of his family. He was a wonderful person. His life had dramatic ups and downs. He and his wife suffered what is surely one of the worst tragedies in life, the passing of a child. I cannot imagine what they went through. A few years later, one day at our daily minion, he was a regular in our minion. I saw him speaking with a younger woman who was there for the yard site of her child who had passed away. And I saw the two of them speaking intensely. I did not approach them. I never asked either of them about their conversation. But in my mind, it was clear to me that he was one of the only people in the world who could speak to this woman helpfully. And here's the amazing part. He was able and willing to enter that dark cave with her. I cannot even imagine the pain it must have cost him to relive his own experience. It was an act of exceptional grace and generosity and selflessness. And he was in this position to be able to offer help and assistance and support that no one else could offer. One idea that I always find helpful for myself, and I suggest it regularly to others, Whenever I go through something difficult, I try to think to myself as I'm going through it, how will I be able to use this experience to help someone else? And if I can focus while I'm going through it, if I can focus on how I'm going to use it, that sometimes gives me some strength and support to be able to get through it. No one wants to be sick. And no one wants to have a friend who is sick. But Letty Pogrebin ends her book with what she calls, and she's the one writing this, the blessings her experience gave her. She writes, this much I know I owe to my illness. It taught me the blessings of silence, despite my natural instinct to fill empty air. It taught me to think twice before bombarding someone with help. It taught me to pay very close attention to sick people's signals that there's a time when they want special attention and a time when the kindest thing you can do is to confer upon them the honor of the ordinary and treat them like anyone else. It taught me to ask and act when I'm with a sick friend and to clearly convey what I need when I'm the patient. Above all, it taught me the importance of telling each other the truth. I hope we will be able to do the same for each other. Emily Dickinson wrote, 
If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching or cool one pain or help one fainting robin onto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. My friends, I want to wish you a great day. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.